Okay, let's review chapter 31 of Educated. So this chapter has sort of has like three parts. The first part we see before Tara leaves the mountain, she goes to visit, visit her sister Audrey. And she talks about, you know, how sort of desperate the uh, situation at Audrey's house is. She has all these kids hanging all over her. Um, she herself did not get beyond a fifth grade level education. Um, her house has this huge hole in the floor that goes down to the basement. She has all these toddlers around. And so there's just really kind of depressing images that Tara provides for us. Um, also, she keeps noting that Audrey will not really look her in the eyes. Okay, so it's when the children are playing with the tea set that uh, Tara has brought for them that um, the, the, the little girl, I think it was, was acting up. And Tara says to the child, if you act like a child, I'll treat you like one. And I know that you guys can remember Sean telling her that earlier in the book. I'm not really sure what page it's on at this very moment. But so that came out of Tara's mouth. So you can only imagine like her self disgust even that she said it. And then also Audrey heard it. And guess what? She has been told that before. And so finally, Audrey does make eye contact with her and says, Sean used to say that. And so there's this realization here that they have had similar experiences with Sean. Um, and as Tara or Westover, as we will need to refer to her in our writing, as she notes on page 266, somehow it had never occurred to me that my sister might have lived my life before I did. I don't know if you guys remember, I'm, I think it was Richard that uh, Tara suspected had, maybe Richard or Tyler, she suspected that Sean had, all, had abused or tormented all of them at some point, I think, um, but she never made the note about Audrey, and Audrey is older than she, and um, so she realizes for the first time that Audrey probably suffered um, the same treatment that she had. So, um, that incident happens, and it's sort of just left there, and then um, Tara goes back, to, goes back to school and really immerses herself into her schoolwork. Um, she's studying, um, interested in John Stuart Mill's work. Um, her professor is even already talking about a possible PhD, and keep in mind, she's only at her master's level now, so he's already kind of looking ahead for her, looking at that doctorate. Um, and she's also determined to fit in with others, so she is trying to be more sociable. And in doing so, she gets invited to Rome for spring break by Nick. Um, and so a group of them goes to Rome for spring break. Um, and she struggles with this setting. So, you know, she's from this very rural place with a junkyard in it. Um, and so she's already had to make adjustments everywhere she's been. She... BYU was one adjustment, and then Cambridge was another. Well, Rome seems to be, you know, on a completely different level um, where, again, we have all this historic architecture and, and just this great history here um, in this place. And her peers seem to take it all in stride and seem to participate in their discussions. Um, but it's like Tara can't get past the enormity, the greatness of it all until on page uh, let's see 268 there is a storm a storm happens and so that was the one unifying thing she realized um standing on the balcony watching the lightning she she kind of felt like home like the buck's peak like she's witnessed these storms before and that allowed her to sort of i don't know consolidate um every you know the fact that this is still just earth um, and she said she felt more present than ever um, at that point. Top of page 269. I don't know what caused the transformation, why suddenly I could engage with the great thinkers of the past rather than revere them to the point of muteness. But there was something about that city with its white marble and black asphalt crusted with history ablaze in traffic lights that showed me I could admire the past without being silenced by it. I was still breathing in the fussiness of ancient stone when I arrived in Cambridge. I rushed up the staircase, anxious to check my email, knowing there would be a message from Drew. When I opened my laptop, I saw that Drew had written, but so had someone else, my sister. All right, so the, this first paragraph at the top here, 
Look at that. Look at that um, last line. I could admire the past without being silenced by it. I think that there's there's bigger you know stories here. She's being very much silenced by the past of her family, the past of their religion. Um, and so she's trying to learn how to not be silenced by that. She's trying to emerge from that. And then we see this transition to the remainder of the chapter, which is getting back to Audrey. So the little Rome spring break story is sandwiched in between the two stories about Audrey. So she receives an email from Audrey, and of course, as um, she suspected, Audrey had suffered you know, quite a bit of abuse at the hands of Sean, and Audrey is ready to, to go to their parents about him for fear that Emily is going to be abused, continue to be abused if something is not done about him. Um, and so, of course, Tara responds in kind, and then um, her mother emails her as well, kind of wanting to hear it from her, her words. They wanted to hear from each other. Um, so, at this point, the mother seems... Uh, repentant, um, uh, penitent maybe is a better word. Um, she's she's showing that you know she sees she knows that Sean um, was abusing them, um, but she tried to ignore it for years and tried to believe that he wasn't. She also comments on um, the father's bipolar disorder, which is shocking to Tara. And um, she also admits that she, too, has been bullied in her life. Later in the chapter, when, she, when Tara talks to her again, um, the mother says that it is being dealt with. So Tara has hope here that somehow this situation is being taken care of back at home. Um, so getting back to her life at Cambridge, because of this knowledge that maybe things are going to be okay in her family, she is able to participate with her peers a little bit differently. Look at 273. I told them I'd been poor. I told them I'd been ignorant. And in telling them this, I felt not the slightest prick of shame. Only then did I understand where the shame had come from. It wasn't that I hadn't studied in a marble conservatory or that my father wasn't a diplomat. Here, look here. Here's where the shame. It's not in being poor or being uneducated. Here's where her shame comes in. It wasn't that Dad was half out of his mind or that Mother followed him. It had come from having a father who shoved me toward the chomping blades of the shear instead of pulling me away from them. It had come from those moments on the floor, from knowing that Mother was in the next room, closing her eyes and ears to me and choosing for that moment not to be my mother at all. So I'm going to stop right there and point out that this has to do with her safety in, in whether or not she felt love from them. I fashioned a new history for myself. I became a popular dinner guest with my stories of hunting and horses, of scrapping and fighting mountain fires, of my brilliant mother, midwife and entrepreneur, of my eccentric father, junkman and zealot. I thought I was finally being honest about the life I had before. It wasn't the truth exactly, but it was true in a larger sense true to what would be in the future now that everything had changed for the better, now that Mother had found her strength. The past was a ghost, insubstantial, unaffecting. Only the future had weight. So we leave chapter 31 with Tara feeling very hopeful that her um, life is going to be different going forward, that her family is going to be different.